the worship services of the First Missionary Baptist Church in Huntsville. We're striving to become one of the most loving churches in all the world. Please join us now for a portion of our worship service. The book of Hebrews is not an easy book to understand. One main clue to understanding it is to always keep in mind the persons to whom it was written. When you read the inscription, it says, an epistle to the Hebrews, which is to say that the clue to understanding this book somewhat lies in the fact that it's written to the Hebrews. Now, these Hebrews were Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians who were undergoing persecution perhaps by their own countrymen. And they were tempted to escape this persecution by drifting back into Judaism. The rituals, the ceremonies, the rites, and the laws of Judaism. In order to escape this persecution, Many of them were considering giving up Jesus the best and going back to some lesser relationship. And so the writer of Hebrews warns and challenges them not to drift, not to slip back into, not to turn away from the superior to the inferior. Remember last Sunday, we talked about the superiority of Jesus. And we discussed that he was superior in his revelation of God. He was superior in his priestly ministry. And we said he was superior to the angels. But in between, we also pointed out that he was superior to Moses and the law, and he was superior to Elijah and the prophets, and even superior, as we close, to all of the angels, and that includes the archangels. So since you found the superior and the supreme revelation of God in Jesus Christ, the writer of Hebrews says these Jewish Christians don't let persecution or anything else turn you away from Jesus. For to turn from him would be to turn from the centerpiece of Christianity and turn to the shadow. And when you read Paul carefully, especially in the book of Colossians, Paul said that the law was a shadow of things to come, but the reality, the substance, is Christ. The centerpiece of Christianity is Christ. So he says to them, you don't want to really drift, go back from the superior to the inferior, from the substance in Christ to the shadow. Now, when Paul called the law the shadow, you've heard me use this illustration before, and it's worth using again. You and I, well, let, let, let's say, because I'm talking about men right now, we men, well, let's, let's even not talk about men. Let's talk about boys, because that's when you date in court, when you're boys. Of course, if you, you know, you don't have a wife and you're a man, you can date in court then. But young men would look silly dating a young lady. And when you felt that urge to kiss her, 
and she felt that urge to be kissed by you. And rather than you kissing her, you stooped down on the ground or the floor and kissed her shadow. I mean, that would be really silly. And it certainly wouldn't have any value for you, nor her. So Paul says that the law was a shadow of things to come. And when you move from Christ, the superior, and start kissing the shadow, the law, you silly. You've drifted from the substance, the reality, to the shadow. You'd be going from the superior to the inferior. You'd be going from the best to something much less. You'd be going in the tradition of the Bible from Calvary back to Mount Sinai. You'd be going from grace back to law. You'd be going from Jesus back to Moses and the law. You would be going from the centerpiece of Christianity back to the shadow. And that would be a terrible mistake. One day in the gospel as recorded by John, when some people were walking away from Jesus because they didn't understand it, and some just walking away because they didn't like what he was preaching, he looked at his disciples and said, will you also go away? To that, Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Luke picks up on this same theme in the book of Acts when he says, There is no other name under heaven given whereby persons can be saved other than the name Jesus. Now, because these Hebrew Christians were tempted to turn from this great salvation in Jesus Christ to a lesser experience in Judaism, in its rituals and in its ceremonies and in its laws. In verse 3, the writer of Hebrews says, And how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. The answer is there is no escape. If you miss salvation in Jesus, the centerpiece of our faith, you've missed out. And you're on your way toward deterioration, spiritual deterioration, spiritual destruction, and ultimately hell. Now, in order to beef up his thesis, the author of Hebrews spends the remaining part of chapter 2 describing this great salvation that is in Jesus, the centerpiece, God's reality, God's full man who is brought to the world, full salvation, a salvation that nobody should neglect. Now as he spends the rest of this chapter on this verse he says that this great salvation was given by God. It's right here in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? It was given by God. God sent Jesus to announce to the world that salvation is now through him in the new 
covenant of his blood. That, that's why we take communion. It's the new covenant in his blood. That's what the wine stands for when we drink it. It's the new covenant in his blood. Not in ceremonies and goat's blood and sheep's blood and calf's blood and turtle dove's blood. It's the new covenant in his blood. And Jesus came preaching that salvation. He came preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He came preaching, I've come that you may have life. If you read the first part of that verse, it says that the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. He came preaching the gospel of the word of God. He came preaching the new covenant of his blood. Next, the author of Hebrews says that this great salvation was confirmed by those who heard him. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, brought by the Lord, the Lord's word, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Who heard him? The believers, the Christians, and particularly the inner circle of the twelve. They, they heard him. And when they heard him, and accepted him, they followed him. And they were assigned to preach the word, to evangelize, to spread the word. Let me just use two illustrations. Peter is a classic example. On the day of Pentecost, did he spread the word? Folk were gathered from all over the world of that day. They had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And on that day, when God sent his Holy Spirit and filled those folks' lives, Peter, you remember, as it filled the 120 folks' lives, Peter, you remember, stood up and preached because they accused the 120 of being drunk. Peter stood up and preached and said, no, we're not drunk. This is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And in that day, he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And that's what he's done today. And so I'm preaching because he's done that. And he preached to that crowd and said, you crucified him, but God raised him up. And you ought to believe in what God did in the miracle of raising him. And on that day, you remember 3,000 persons turned from their way turned from being Jewish proselytes and became Christians. They were saved. They received the Holy Spirit and they were baptized. His word was preached by those who heard. Peter is one classic example, but Paul is another classic example. You know, Paul got saved on the Damascus Road Next thing that rascal did was start preaching. Lord called him to preach, start preaching. And you know what you can do? You can sum up Paul's sermon in two verses in Ephesians. Everywhere he went on the good and everything he preached was these two little verses. They ain't little, they big, but I just say two little verses. For you are Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For you are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, not by going back into Judaism, keeping some ceremony, following some ritual, keeping some law, not by any of that stuff, which was a shadow of things to come, 
but you're saved by faith, by grace, through faith. That not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If you could work your way and get your salvation, you got something to boast about. Yeah. Yeah. If I could work and get my salvation, I could walk up to Linda and say, look, man, I've done more than you've done. Well, I got yeah. more salvation than you got, well, yeah. but I don't have anything to brag about. Yes, because at Calvary, yeah. when Jesus died for us, he slapped all of our works yeah. out the window. Yeah. And we are surely, wholly, fully saved by his precious death yes. and blood in the new covenant at Calvary. Yeah. Thirdly, the writer of Hebrews says that this great salvation manifested by signs and wonders and miracles. Yes, sir. I'll read it again. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, it was sent by the Lord, given by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. And I just gave you two illustrations, Peter and Paul. Verse 4, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and with various miracles. You mean to tell me? That's what Paul is saying. I mean, excuse me, that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying to the Jewish Christians who were thinking about, because of persecution, slipping back into Judaism so that they wouldn't be persecuted. You mean you're going to give up a salvation so great, filled with signs? and wonders, and miracles? You're going to give all that up to go back to something inferior? You mean you're going to give up Jesus, who took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000 folk, 5,000 men, not including the women and children? You mean to tell me you're going to give up a salvation of miracles and signs and wonders where he was on his way to heal Jairus' daughter and a woman stopped him on the way and touched the hem of his garment and she had been bleeding for 12 long years and when she just touched his garment her bleeding stopped she was healed you mean you're going to give up miracles and wonders and signs like that to go back to something inferior? Well, you mean you're going to give up a Jesus who could go to sleep in a boat, yeah, yeah. sleep in a storm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and disciples awoke him yeah. and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Well, he got up, wiped his sleep as the old preacher said, stood up and spoke to the winds. Peace, be still. Winds bowed at his voice. Hushed. And the Bible said that was a great calm. You mean to tell me you're going to give up miracles like that? To go back to something inferior? You mean to tell me you're going to give up a Jesus of miraculous acts who stopped by a cemetery when a man had been dead, lying in the tomb for four days, body had already begun to deteriorate. He stopped by and called him by name. Lazarus. When he called Lazarus up from the grave, he arose. Lazarus standing up, Jesus looked at him and said, loose him and let him go. You mean you want to give up miracles like that for something inferior? You mean you're going to give up Jesus, the centerpiece, the substance, to go back to the shadow. Well, well, then, in the fourth place, he reminded these Hebrew Christians that God had given them gifts of the Spirit. That's the second part of verse 4. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles 
and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. You mean to tell me you're going to give up all these precious gifts of the Holy Spirit to go back to some ritual, some ceremony that has no generating power in it? You're going to go from the powerless Excuse me, you're going to go from the powerful to the powerless? Gifts of the Spirit? Let me just name a few of them. Some people say 19, others 20. Okay. I just name a few. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says he's given these gifts for the profit of all for the profit of the whole church, P-R-O-F-I-T, for the profit of the whole church, for the good of the whole church. He's given some apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some who work miracles, helpers, administrators, tongues, and then when he gets through with those, guess what he does? He says, now I show you a more excellent gift, a more excellent way. And he turns over to chapter 13 and says, And though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I'm just making noise. So if you want the best gift of all, get the gift of love. Love covers a multitude of faults. Love fulfills the law. Don't neglect, he says, such a great salvation to go back to something inferior. Remember, Christ is the son of peace of our faith. And then he closes this discussion in verse 9 by refocusing on Jesus, the son of peace, and doing a comparison. And listen to what he says. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned, or you said now crowned, with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He goes back and makes the comparison. But we see Jesus. I mean, that's a good sermon right, by, I mean, right there by itself. But we see Jesus. Just look at Jesus. <laughs> but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death now crowned with glory and honor. Watch what the writer of Hebrews is doing for us. Watch the movement in the picture of Jesus he's presenting. We see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. Now last Sunday, when I finished the sermon, the writer of Hebrews told me to say, He's superior to the angels. Didn't I close on that? He's superior to the angels because the angels serve him. Angels minister to him. But now he comes back and says, we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. Why, man? Because that was a part of God's great plan of salvation. In order for Jesus to become like us, Feel what we feel. Go through with what we go through. Sit where we sit. Walk a mile in our moxon. Bear what we bear. Go through the infirmities that we go through. Go through the trials and tribulations that we go through. Go through the sickness and the heartaches that we go through. In order for Jesus to feel all of that, 
God made him lower than the angel, made him a man, made him in the substance just as we are, so he can become what we have become, but without sin. Made him a little lower than the angels, but then watch the turn. Goes back up, made him a little lower than the angel, but has now crowned him with glory and honor. Well, Mr. Writer of Hebrews, how did you get from Jesus being made lower than the angel up to crowned with glory and honor? The author answers in the verses in between that you need to read when you go home. He arrived at the glory and honor through sacrificial service. Verse 9, see that are read, by the grace of God, he tasted death for everyone. By the grace of God, he tasted death for everyone. What the writer of Hebrews does now is to bring us back to the cross, to the Christ event. His life, his sacrificial death at Calvary, and his resurrection. He moves from down here to up there. He moves from being lower than the angels to be crowned with glory and honor. You see, my dear, Jesus did not arrive at glory and honor by catching a fast jet airplane and flying out of this world. But he arrived at glory and honor by going to a cross and dying like a thief, dying like a common criminal out on a cross. And before he died on that cross, he went through what you and I go through. He went through some struggles. He had to struggle with himself. He had to wrestle with why I got to go to this cross. And in that garden of Gethsemane, he told the Lord, Lord, I don't want to drink this cup. It's bitter. Don't want the agony and pain of Calvary. It's bitter. But he resolved in Gethsemane by the power of God. I'm going to Calvary and I'm going to carry out God's salvation mission. I'm going to die for the sins of the whole world. I'm going to do it by the grace of God. And because he died at Calvary by the grace of God and tasted death and hell for every one of us, God Turn it all around. Early Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead. God raised him up with power, all power in heaven and in earth. In his hand, God crowned him, gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, look at Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus.